Okay, good. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and I would like to thank my uh, the organizers for giving us this chance to show you some of our group's recent work in looking for flat bands um, in bulk uh, quantum materials. And um, this is the version of this talk was what I did for my job talk a couple years ago. Fantastic uh, emergent faces, but now we're looking for flat bands. Um, so our motivation is that we want to search for uh, topological flat bands in bulk materials where hopefully uh, the energy scale, temperature scale may be higher and which is accessible for, for more experimental probes. And so I think um, I don't need to motivate too much about um, why we're interested in look for um, flat dispersions, um, but this was already very well uh, motivated and introduced yesterday in the talks by Andre uh, Pernovic, uh, uh, Linda, and also Gabe. So I just wanted to uh, just to emphasize that um, there are many ways to construct uh, flat dispersions in, in bulk materials and, uh, and using the, the, the uh, theme of geometric frustration. And so um, take from the uh, analogy from the, from the field of quantum spin liquid, uh, we know that uh, there's geometric frustration for certain types of, uh, of, of lattices. Uh, in the two, 2D case, there's the Kagomi lattice, and then in 3D, there's the pyre core. And then uh, if we take the same analogy of these kind of geometric frustration to fermionic models, then we can localize the electronic wave function due to destructive interference, uh, and then localize the electronic states in real space, and therefore that will give us uh, 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 bands with uh, quenched uh, kinetic energy in momentum space. So um, our group's recent efforts has been looking into uh, systems uh, first in the Kagomi system, as Punchon discussed earlier, I'm going to show a, a, a one or two slides on the system, but also look into other types of uh, bulk materials. And I'm going to show you three examples here. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the first type, which is 2D Kagomi system, and then show you uh, we can also image flat dispersions and direct cones in 3D power core lattices, uh, where the geometric frustration is actually there in 3D. In 3D. And then I will hope to spend the most of my time talking about this very last example where uh, we recently think we discovered a way to tune uh, the geometric frustration, turn it on and off uh, using a, a simple thermal annealing quenching process, which is hosted, uh, which is used to tune some kind of uh, vacancy ordering that gives rise to this kind of pipe lattice. So as we know that if we use, um, if we think about carry out tight binding calculation uh, considering the nearest neighbor hopping, then we can get flat dispersions um, for all of these cases. And but of course in real materials, the band dispersions are much more compli complicated. So I'm going to show you how uh, our efforts in looking into this kind of systems in real materials. These are the three systems that we have looked at. Um, the first case is iron germanium, as Puntron already discussed. I'm going to tell you uh, very briefly what is our perspective on understanding the role of ma magnetism in producing the charge density wave in iron germanium, and then move on to show you uh, an, an example of a three-dimensional pyre core lattice where we can also uh, see the uh, three-dimensional flat, flat bands and also uh, Dirac cones uh, produced by the geometric frustration. And finally, talk about this last example, which is uh, Van der Waals uh, near room temperature ferromagnet FGT, where we see this uh, 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 this, uh, this, uh, this this case of switchable uh, switching between two topologically distinct uh, phases. Okay, so for the first case, iron germanium. Um, so. I don't need to introduce this again, but just to emphasize that it's, it's very, very well known from theory uh, carried out on 2D Kagomi lattice that um, the tight binding calculation gives rise to a pair of Hoff singularities that gives rise to a divergent density of states. So if you tune your chemical potential to be near one of these Hoff singularities, then you can produce this kind of hexagonal Fermi surface, and there you can have uh, three pairs of uh, well nested Fermi surfaces that will give you uh, a nesting at the Q, uh, which has been exactly the Q discovered for the charge density wave orders in Stephen Wilson's 135 uh, non-magnetic Kagomi system as well as iron germanium. So, um, so we decided to look into this system, and um, to make a long story short, um, this is I'm going to present to you our understanding of the system uh, from the from the uh, photon emission and also uh, uh, DFT perspective. So the understanding is the following. Of course, if you uh, do the real DFT calculation, it's much more complicated. But if you squint your eyes a little bit, these uh, great box area is where the flat bands are. And that corresponds to high density states at the Fermi level for the paramagnetic state. 
Um, so what is the effect of a magnetic order in the system? So if we consider the magnetic order, it's A-type AFM. That means within each Kagome layer is ferromagnetic, and therefore we can actually carry out uh, calculations in a spin-projected way. So for each layer, we can calculate, um, actually this is a calculation from Bing Haiyan's group, the spin minority and spin majority band dispersions in the AFM phase, and there you can see that the single uh, peak in the density of states gets split into two, and they correspond to the flat dispersions that are shifted up by the spin minority bands and the, and the ones that are shifted down by the spin majority bands. So the effect of this, if I can represent with a simple schematic, is the following. So up starting in the paramagnetic state, uh, you have the spin degenerate um, spin up, spin down, degenerate band dispersions. And then when the A-type EFM orders within each layer, there's an exchange splitting that occurs th such that there is a spin minority set of bands that shifts up in energy. And the effect of this is that the whole singularities that used to be quite far away from the Fermi level are now brought closer to the Fermi level. And, um, and this is, uh, actually happens to be consistent with our observation, which is that um, at the onset of the CEW order, we do observe the, the, the Van Hoof singularities to be uh, very close to the Fermi level. And in addition, uh, from photo emission, we also observe that there is CEW gap that ha uh, opens on the Van Hoof singularity bands. And so this is the EDC energy taken at on the Van Hoof singularity bands at the, zone, uh, at the end point. And you can see the gap opening there. That gap opening is, uh, is uh, starts onsets uh, uh, roughly consistent with the onset of the CEW order. However, if you look at other bands, away from the Van Hoof bands, we don't observe any gap opening there. So we only observe these gap opening, uh, which is anisotropic, occurs on the Van Hoof band. And as Pontron already uh, discussed, we also observe evidence for electron photon coupling. So this is the RPS band dispersion, and you can see a dispersion kink there. And this kind of kink uh, identifies an energy scale of about 30 millivolts. And this kind of kink, um, and, and now uh, in comparison to any last neutron scattering, we can identify this, this bosonic mode around 30 millivolts to be from, a phonon, from an optical phonon, which mod is modified across CW transition temperature. And the interesting thing is we only observe this kind of electron phonon coupling uh, on the Van Hoof singularity bands at the end point. And this phonon mode, uh, this, uh, this, this, this modification, also occurs at the end point from the ENS neutron scattering. So uh, to make a long story short, our understanding, our current understanding of how CW actually arises in iron germanium is that the mechanism is there to really bring the Van Hoof singularity points uh, from far away to the Fermi level, closer to the Fermi level due to the uh, ordering of, of, the mag of the magnetic moment. And then uh, the proximity of the Van Hoof singularities in the Fermi level is probably, there. it's not sufficient to induce CW, uh, but it's likely there uh, to, to select the Q vector, which is eventually the Q vector that's observed uh, in the ordering of the CW order. And then in addition, uh, these, this ingredients of the electron phonon coupling is also likely playing an important role. Actually, this kind of electron phonon coupling is also observed in the non-magnetic 135 system uh, where the CW order is also observed. <clears throat> okay, so that's a very brief uh, discussion of iron germanium. I want to also introduce to you our recent work uh, looking at three-dimensional pyrochore lattices. So, um, so pyrochore lattices are, if you think about them, the, the structure of a pyrochore lattice, as we know, uh, um, um, you can, there, if you cut through it, there are two ways to cut through it. Um, if you cut through it in, this, in such a way, you can actually expose a Kagome lattice, right? And you can see the Kagome lattice here and also here. Uh, the important thing is here is that the destructive interference is actually three-dimensional. What that means is that if you carried out uh, type binding calculations, um, uh, the, the, the one unit amplitude here, if you look at this, is, this is the unicell, there are four lat lattice sites. Um, the one, the lattice site, which is not contained in the Kagome lattice, actually has identical zero amplitude. What that means is that the Kagome layers in the, in the pyrochore lattice is, are completely decoupled from each other. So this is the improvement from, from the 2D Kagome uh, lattices, because in the 2D Kagome lattices, we realize in a bulk material, you always have interlayer coupling. So in a pyrochore lattice, that interlayer lot coupling is actually also uh, destroyed because of this uh, destructive interference. So the end result is that if you carry out the tight binding calculations, you get two copies, two degenerate flat bands, uh, which have a touching point with two dispersive bands, and then when you include some or spin orbit coupling, um, you, uh, you, 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 you open up a gap uh, at this triple degeneracy point to bring it to a double degenerate point and also a single, single degenerate point there. 
Um, in addition, where's the topology? Um, so it turns out that for a pyrochore lattice, uh, this is well known, um, for a pyrochore lattice, there's a non-somorphic symmetry, and associated with a non-somorphic symmetry means that there is a protected point at the X point of the Brillouin zone where all the, all the, all, all the bands uh, remain fourfold degenerate, um, even in the presence of spin orbit coupling, it remains gapless. So it, it produces three-dimensional direct points at the X point. And so, um, Pyrochore lattices are, pyrochore materials are very hard to image for photo emission for a long time because these are cubic and so they're very hard to cleave. But the, with the recent improvement with photo emission and spatial resolution, it is now possible to measure these uh, three-dimensional uh, pyrochore lattices. If you cleave enough, you will end up with one surface that you can, you can, you can image. And so uh, we recently uh, look into this pyrochore lattice, which is cerium ruthenium 2 and this is a superconductor that was actually discovered by Matthias himself uh, 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 six, six, six decades ago. It has a TC of about 5 Kelvin, and it turns out if you look at the lattice, the ruthenium lattice, uh, sub-lattice, forms this uh, pyrochore lattice, it, and it turns out when we do the photo emission, we can actually observe very flat dispersions uh, with a bandwidth uh, less than 30 millivolts close to the Fermi level. Uh, and, and not only are they flat in the in-plane direction, but they're also flat in the out-of-plane directions. And in addition, we can also see direct crossings, three-dimensional direct crossings at the, at the, at the X point of the Brayon zone. So um, this is a very brief uh, introduction. This is work is led by Jianwei, and also uh, I just want to give credit to Chen Nen Seti and Timel for bringing our attention to, uh, to looking to pyrochore lattices as additional platform um, uh, beyond the Kagomi lattice to look for these uh, flat dispersions. And, 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 and we're working in this direction to look for more pyrochore lattices with, uh, with uh, symmetry broken faces to look for the effect of this, uh, these uh, topological flat bands in these systems. Okay, so that brings me to the last point, which I really want to spend a lot more time on. Uh, and this is a system which is uh, actually quite, uh, we're quite excited about this, uh, about this result. Um, so, so this is uh, one slight summary of what we, are, uh, we, we find in this, in this system. So um, the end result is that we find we're able to actually observe a topological switch between two, uh, top, between two distinct electronic phases. One is that of a magnetic wild nodal line system phase, and the other one are these uh, flat dispersions. And if we think that we can understand uh, the origin of these topological features based on, uh, based, on the, uh, based on the symmetry of the crystals. And we can actually tune the switch back and forth between the two phases via a simple annealing and uh, an crunching process. And, the, the, and our understanding of the switchability, at which I will introduce, is due to a very interesting uh, ordering of, a, of iron vacancy in this material that is actually uh, modified in this quenching process. So I'm going to go through this in three steps. Um, after introducing the FGT family, I'm going to first show you uh, what we observe from photo emission, what are the uh, details of the two distinct electronic phases. Uh, and then I will tell you how we understand uh, these particular um, topological features based on analysis of the, of the crystal symmetry that we, can, uh, that we understand from the two phases achieved by this uh, different types of uh, thermal uh, treatment process. And then the very last step, I will show you the switchability between the two phases back and forth. So that's the, that's the, method, that's the steps I will take. So first, a couple of slides about introducing the family of FGT. Iron, germanium, tellurium, which I've been calling FGT, belongs to really a, a family of uh, exfoliable venerable ferromagnets. They're magnetic, and they were discovered a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see here, these are the three members of this family. Um, they are all made of uh, these uh, stacking of venerable layers. Um, and the gray ones are the tellurium, and then the, the green uh, atomic sites are the germanium. And the only difference between iron 3, uh, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, and 5, 1, 2 is the amount of um, red stuff, which is iron within each layer. And these materials have been demonstrated that they can retain long range ferromagnetic order down to the monolayer regime uh, when exfoliated down. So today I'm only going to focus on the last member, FGT512, uh, and these are the family that has the highest uh, TC among this family, and the Curie temperature um, is uh, somewhere between 250 Kelvin to 320 Kelvin, depending on the way you prepare the crystal and the exact stoichiometry. Why do I want to focus on the 512? Because there's, a very, there's something very special the, about the 512 material, uh, which is additional degree of freedom not present in the 312 and 412. So I'm going to show you what that is. And that brings me to the, to the introduction of the crystal structure. So this is a little bit technical, but I think it's very important uh, because this is basically the key to how we can switch this material between the two phases. So this is a TEM image. Uh, you can see the venerable slabs and uh, a unicell, a single unicell of FGT512 consists of three 
uh, three ABC stack layers, vulnerable layers. If I zoom into one of these, uh, I want to show you uh, what they actually look like. So this is a single, single slab. On the outside of the slab are the tellurium atoms, uh, and then the blue ones are the germanium atoms. Now, the rest of the stuff is all iron, and um, among all the iron sites, uh, there are three distinct iron sites. This is very important. And the way you can read this off is by first looking at the inversion center. So this, this single slab is actually uh, inversion symmetric, and the inversion center is right here between the two uh, blue sites. The closest pair of the inversion symmetric pair are these, and these are the iron two sites. And then the next pair, you have this pair of inversion symmetric pair, which is iron three sites. And those are always fully occupied. The most interesting aspect of this is the last pair, which is the iron one side. You can sh show here, top and down, bottom, right? And the reason they're, they're grayed out is the following, which is that if you have a, a stoichiometric iron five, germanium, tellurium two, what that means is that only one, one and only one of these two sites is occupied at any given time. And so, um, so, um, so you can, the iron one can either, between each pair, it can only occupy either the up one or the lower one, um, and not, uh, not both at the same time. Now, um, the interesting thing is, so let me, let me first show you the in-plane view. If you cut across here and look down, uh, these, are, these are the iron one sides, and this is the next layer down, which is iron three sides, and they're in, in, in the in-plane direction, they are three-fold symmetric. The very interesting thing about this is that the way the iron one chooses to occupy these, iron, these, these split side, um, there, are, there are two possibilities. Uh, as seen from uh, STM, uh, X -ray, single X-ray diffraction, and also TEM measurements, which is that in one case, you can have a complete random occupation between each pair, which means that uh, whether the iron chooses the top side or the down side is totally uncorrelated uh, across the crystal. So in that situation, we can consider an iron one side as a split side, where each one is occupied 50%. And in that situation, you can imagine the crystal actually retains the global inversion symmetry. However, it's also been discovered that it's possible to realize a different phase, and this is also this is a, this is a, a STM image reported previously, showing that it's possible for the iron to choose to occupy the sites in an ordered fashion. So you can imagine that you're taking a line cut here, and it's choosing. So this is only this only shows the iron one side. You can choose up, down, down, up, down, down. So this gives you actually a order, uh, which is root three by root three by this iron one side, uh, which is seen by STM. Okay, so this is the, this is the key to the to the to the tunability, and how do you tune between the two kinds of, uh, uh, of phases? And it's been uh, already demonstrated that the the key to tuning this 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 is by the the speed at which you cool the crystals down from growth. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but just to show you the end result, as people have demonstrated that there is a metastable phase transition at around 550 Kelvin. If you slowly cool the crystal from above this temperature down to room temperature, um, it happens that the, the crystal likes to form these randomly occupied iron one sites, and that's where the inversion symmetry, global inversion symmetry is preserved. Or if you crunch the crystal from above this metastable phase transition, then this is where the root three by root three uh, uh, site occupation water likes to form. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and so this, this experiment, um, shows that actually for the quench crystals, I'm going to call these the quench crystals, these are slow cool crystals. For the quench crystals, the TC happens to be slightly higher. Uh, this is the, as reported. So that, that seems a little bit technical. Let me just summarize on one slide uh, the key to the, to, to the, to the, to the structure to the, to the change. So for the slow cool crystal, the iron one sites are randomly occupied. Therefore, we can think about this as a 50% occupied split site. And the global symmetry, global inversion symmetry is preserved. Or you can have a quench crystal where you have, you have this ordering. Obviously, the inverse symmetry is broken in this case. So that's the two, the two, uh, the two different types of uh, uh, phases we can actually achieve. OK, so that's the introduction of what is already known in this uh, FGT materials. Um, so we uh, wanted to look into what is, uh, what is this changing if the symmetry uh, does to the, to the electronic structure. So to our surprise, when we, when we measure this uh, in the beginning, we see two different types of electronic structures. They're quite different. I'm going to show you that on the, on the next couple of slides. So here, side by side, are measurements taken on a slow cool crystal and also on a quench crystal. You can see they're taken under the same, exact same conditions of uh, uh, temperature, uh, um, polarization, so on and so forth. And you can already see that the fermiology, there's some resemblance, which are there are these concentric circles around the, around the gamma pocket. And those are these hole-like bands around the gamma points. 
But you can already see there's distinction, uh, which, which are shown here. So I'm going to take you through each of these and show you what is, what is actually the key difference in the two types of uh, uh, electronic structures. So let's first look at the left-hand side, which are the slow cooled crystals. OK, so here is the formulaology again. If you take a high symmetry cut uh, across the zone center, gamma, M, gamma, gamma K, M direction like this, uh, I hope, I don't know if it shows up well, but you can see that at the K point, uh, there is this uh, uh, crossing here between the two bands. And if you can't see that very well, um, let me try to blow this up for you. So we can zoom in to around the K point here. And uh, the way we can look at this is by take a bunch of parallel cuts in the vertical direction. Those are shown on the top. And then, we, or we can also take the horizontal cuts, uh, which are shown on the bottom. And then the middle one, uh, which is boxed by this green uh, square, are the ones cutting through uh, the K point. And I hope you can see that this is a second derivative uh, to enhance the visibility. You can see there's a band crossing at the K point here. And then as you go to either side, walking away from the K point, there's a gap which opens. You can also see this on the, on the, on the vertical cut, uh, even though we only see one branch, but we see there's no gap here, and then that opens up a gap on either side. So this, this indicates there indeed is a, a direct crossing at the K point uh, of this, uh, of this uh, slow cool crystal. Now, this is all in plane, right? So um, the next thing we want to do is look at the out of plane direction, uh, probing KZ by varying the photon energy. And regardless of which photon energy we, we, we measure, we always see this crossing around the K point. So this indicates that this crossing is really a nodal line, which is lining around the zone boundary here um, of this brain zone. Now, every data set I'm going to show you today in this talk were all measured deep in the ferromagnetic state, around 15 Kelvin. Uh, which means that the time reversal symmetry is broken, so there can only be uh, uh, double degeneracy, which means that these uh, crossings uh, really must be violent lines around the, around the zone boundary. So this is what we see um, for the left-hand side, which is the observation of these uh, violent lines. The more interesting case, and the even more interesting case, is the right-hand side, which is the quench, quench crystals. So here, immediately, you can already see the formulaology looks a little bit different. Um, and the difference is that, one of the differences is that if you look at the same high symmetry cut, we no longer see the crossings at the K point. These crossings are lifted. <clears throat> and more interestingly, we start to see these very flat dispersions uh, going across the Brion zone. And not only do they appear on the high symmetry cut, but we can probe the entire Brion zone. So um, you can see that for these series of cuts here, you can, you can very clearly observe these, the, three, the, three, uh, the, three, uh, the three sets of flat bands, which are actually uh, quite flat uh, over a large portion of the brain zone, except where they come to hybridize with the disper dispersive bands near the gamma point, which shows that they're not really due to disorder, but they must be intrinsic to the, to the crystals themselves. OK, so that's, the, that's just the ARPA's observation. Um, next, I want to show you um, how we can understand the origin of, these, the, of this dichotomy of the electronic structure. So the very first thing we want to do uh, is to probe the symmetry of the two kinds of crystals that we, uh, uh, that, we, that, we, that we obtain from slow cooling or from quenching. So we reach out to our, to our friend, uh, Liang Wu at uh, Yupin, uh, to measure the second harmonic generation. And lo and behold, what they see is that um, they see a very strong uh, second harmonic generation for the quench crystals. Um, but very little, basically very few counts uh, for, the, for the slow cool crystals. This means that, um, at least from this measurement, the inversion, the, the inversion symmetry is indeed broken in the quench crystal and, um, and, and, and preserved in the slow cool crystal. This is actually very cons consistent with our understanding of, how, of the formation of this iron one site ordering in the quench crystal, which, where the inversion symmetry is broken. And then if you have a random occupation of the iron one sites, then the global inversion symmetry will be preserved. So um, more than that, we can also look into, given this kind of uh, 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 crystal structure, how do we understand the, 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 the appearance of these, uh, top, uh, of these uh, vial nodal lines in the first case. So here, the situation is quite clear. If we have a preserved global, symmetry, global inversion symmetry, um, the crystal also has a C3Z, which is three-fold rotation symmetry about the z-axis and also two-fold rotation about the y-axis. And given these ingredients, uh, that would give us cross the direct crossing at the k-point. This has been known for many materials. And in addition, if you break time re reversal symmetry by uh, seeing this in the ferromagnetic state, then uh, this will become a, uh, a two, two, two-fold degenerate point. And then if you further increase the overcoupling, this would open up a gap uh, around the k-point. So this is for understanding of the symmetry based on a single Van der Waals slab. And I told you that 
the system, uh, the unit cell actually contains ABC stacking of these vulnerable Wall slabs. So if you consider the ABC stacking of this, uh, it's not hard to, to, to go from that point to the following, uh, which is that, um, first of all, uh, there's very, we inter in very weak interlayer coupling because this is a Van der Waals material after all. So that means the first, uh, first order business is that the vial crossings become extended into a wild the line ar around the zone boundary. But because this is ABC stacking, uh, the, the Brillion zone is, not, uh, is no longer a hexagonal uh, uh, thing. So there is, a, uh, there is additional um, uh, uh, warping or winding of these nodal lines around, 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 the, around the zone boundary. And this has actually been seen in other materials. Actually, Linda already showed this yesterday uh, for, for iron 3, 10, 2. And you can, for ABC stack, uh, uh, such kind of materials, you can get naturally this kind of winding where the K and K prime points have opposite chiralities. So this seems to be consistent with our observation of the, of the, of the crossings uh, at the K point. It just only thing is that because the, the degree to which the, the, the nodal lines wind depends on the strength of interlayer coupling and because these are vulnerables, we don't actually observe, uh, uh, cannot resolve the actual winding. We just see basically around the K point. So I think we understand um, how we can get the nodal lines in the first case. Now we can talk about the more interesting case, uh, even more interesting case, which, which is the quench crystals. So the first, thing, the, the first thing we did for these crystals was to, to collaborate, to, 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 to check with STM uh, by collaboration with Eduardo da Silva NATO at Yale to see indeed we do have the, the root three by root three ordering of iron one sites. And they can see when, they're, when they cleave the crystal, the entire, even though they can only image within their field of view, but within that field of view, they can do indeed observe this kind of uh, root three by root three ordering um, and consistent with previous literature. Now, the interesting thing is if you consider this kind of ordering, uh, actually the shortest bond uh, within each slab is between that of the iron one and also the one next layer down, which is iron three. This is the shortest bond. So if we took the in-plane view of, this, of, this, uh, of, the, of these two layers, that's shown here. And so here, the red uh, sites are the iron one occupied sites and the empty ones are the, um, uh, are the empty ones uh, from this ordering. And the, the cool thing about this is that there's a repeating of th this kind of clover shape uh, unicell. And if you stare at this for a while, uh, if you consider only the nearest neighbor hopping, this actually gives us a bipartite lattice uh, where the hopping is only between the sublattice, A, a sublattice and B sublattice. And, um, and uh, furthermore, if the number of sites belonging to sublattice A and sublattice B is different within each unicell, uh, then this is where you get zero modes or flat bends, which is there's uh, work done by Andrew uh, uh, Brnovic and, 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 and et al. And, and showing that this is indeed true. So we, ch we check this by carrying out tight binding calculations. Uh, and indeed, you can get flat dispersions here. And then if you input spin over coupling, then uh, the flat bends require a churn number. And so this at least seems to us to be very consistent with our observation of the flat dispersions in the quench crystals with this kind, kind of a root three by root three iron, iron one site uh, ordering. So that's the second, that's how we understand the origin of our uh, dichotomy of electronic uh, structures. The last one, thing I want to show you is the switchability between the two phases. How do we switch between the two? So in order to do this, um, and we thought about the following methodology. Um, so to really pr prove that this is really due to the quenching and not to any other dis differences in the crystals, we, we did the following uh, uh, experiment, which is that we can start with a single crystal, prepare either in the quench, initially quench phase or prepare in the initially slow cooled phase. Once the crystals reach room temperature, we cut it in half, we keep half of it as is, and then we take the other half and then we warm it up to, uh, in the furnace above this metastable temperature and do the opposite operation, right? So I'm gonna show you the results for each of these. The first case we did uh, by starting with the quench crystal and then, and then cut in half and, and, and do the slow, slow kneading for the other half. And then we do funnel emission on both halves. So here's what we see. This is the initial untouched half and you can see there's the flat dispersions and no K crossings here. And then when we slow cool the other half, and, and very, very nicely we see the, the switch of the electronic structure into the other phase um, shown here. And then the opposite is also true. So we did the other experiment, which is to start with a slow cooled crystal and then cut it in half 
And you can see this is the initially untouched half, which shows the crossings here. And then when you requench the crystal, it actually gets put into the other state where you have these flat dispersions uh, shown here. And you can it really, it's, it's a, we, we, out of all the materials, the, the crystals that we measure, we always see one of these two uh, faces, or at most a mixture of the two signals uh, suggesting their, their uh, domain population, which is controlled uh, in, the, in the crystal. The very last thing I want to show you, um, uh, this is the experiment we did recently, is uh, to come back to this uh, initial uh, statement I made that for, um, for these, um, for these uh, quench crystals, the TCs seem to be uh, slightly higher. So we recently we did uh, spin resolve RPS measurements uh, on the quench crystals to try to see where the uh, uh, spin polarization actually comes from. So when we measure this in the, in the low temperature, in the ferromagnetic state, um, so here are the EDC, or you can imagine this is a cut where the peaks uh, in energy correspond to the three flat bands. And when we do the spin resolve measurements, uh, we do see that actually the flat, dispersion, flat bands uh, carry uh, opposite uh, spin polarization. Uh, at least uh, you can say uh, that is true for the one uh, cutting across at the Fermi level and the one around 250 millivolts, which seems to suggest that uh, these flat dispersions, which our understanding is coming from geometric frustration, do perhaps uh, contribute to, uh, to, uh, to the magnetization uh, in, these, uh, in, these, uh, in, in these materials. Maybe I spoke too fast. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the story. Uh, so I want to demonstrate. So just to summarize, we see this dichotomy of the electronic structure uh, living in a magnetic wild the line phase uh, and also a geometric flat band phase. And, uh, and we, can, we can demonstrate the switchability between the two types of phases. And our understanding is that here, uh, different from other kinds of crystal symmetries, we can tune this uh, turn on and off this geometric frustration utilizing this, uh, this uh, vacancy ordering uh, uh, through the thermal kneading uh, process. And, and th this is perhaps another way to think about how we can realize in, in uh, bulk crystals uh, additional types of geometric frustrated uh, uh, lattices. So uh, let me thank, uh, acknowledge all of the, the whole team uh, of people who uh, made this uh, last part possible. Uh, the RPS measurement is, is uh, led by my student Han Wu in collaboration with other members of the group. Um, and also, uh, we had just uh, tremendous uh, theory support from Tim L's group uh, with uh, Lei Chen and also Tendon. And then, um, and also the crystals were from Jun Hao Chu's group, uh, grown by his student, uh, Paul Maninowski. So thank you very much. Interesting. So, do, do people understand why separately behaves so strangely in the uh, slow cooling sample? I mean, so, the question I have is yeah, the, the, you the mean, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, do people understand that? This one, yeah, yeah so, it's not a thorough line, but something, something else happens, right? Yeah, so there, there's uh, people uh, think that there's a the iron one side uh, becomes uh, it's dynamic above the temperature, so there's actually I didn't show you temperature dependence, so we, we see a very strong coherence, incoherence change across here. So people think the iron one sites are fluctuating uh, on, above this temperature. This is when they become, uh, so, that's, we, yeah. Have you guys look at X-ray to see whether you have superlattice induced by this vacancy? Yeah, yeah, we, do, we, we have done single crystal XRD and we can see the root three by root three order in the, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So do you understand why when you clench you get uh, more symmetry breaking? I, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. This is a, we don't understand why, but that, that seems to be the case seeing everybody's report. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's very counterintuitive, yeah. Um. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's uh, leave the game. Thank you.